Hi there, Smart Driver. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about freeways, trip planning for going away for the Labor Day weekend, which is coming up next weekend, keeping you safe, driving smarter. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Trying. Here it goes. Any minute now, the intro's coming. There it is. Hi there, Smart Driver. Welcome back. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you today about freeway driving, staying safe, driving smarter, and going away for the Labor Day weekend, which is coming up. Uh, some of you may be postponing that sort of thing. Some of you may not. Uh, Mad Trucker's here. Trey Johnson is here. We're having a great day. Yes, stay positive for sure. And other people will be here joining us as well. So we're getting going on the live stream. Uh, just before we get going here, make sure you head over to the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, just bear with me one second. I'm just going to kick up the light here a little bit. Like look a little dark. Uh, there we go. Kick that up. Save. Okay. Margaret is here. Hello, Margaret. Uh, so head over to the Smart Drive Test website. Click the store. Go in there. There's lots of courses on sale right now. Uh, the Pasture Drivers Test First Time, the Smarter Driver course, the Air Brakes course is on sale. Defensive Driving, Winter Driving Smart. All of those courses are on sale, and the Winter Driving Smart course is on sale. I think it's on sale for 17 bucks actually right now. That course is not just for winter driving. It's also for inclement weather, driving in fog, driving in rain, driving in ice and snow, driving in hail, any uh, inclement weather. So have a look at those courses over at Smart Drive Test website. All right, Ina is here, Pathfinder, Nathan is here, lots of people here, awesome. So we're going to help you out, keep you safe on the Labor Day weekend, get you around, get you safe. And, you know, the world is still a crazy place with all this COVID. And as well, condolences to the family of Chadwick Bozeman. Uh, those of you who are not Avengers fans <laughs> may not know who he is, but uh, Black Panther uh, died a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, I'm a huge Avengers fan. I'm a huge comic book fan. And it was very sad. Uh, to hear about his death. I mean, he was only 43. I mean, he's 11 years younger than me. Oh, it's just awful. Uh, Slivic, uh, hey, Rick, taking my road test as Friday, and the vids really help, and that's really what, and excellent. So glad that we can help out and get you going on your driver's test and those types of things. So, okay, so today we're talking about freeways, driving on highways, keeping you safe. Uh, Dark Abyss, I failed my first test to get my license due to nerves. Yeah, unfortunately, those will get the best of you. And the one of the ways, you know, you got to self-talk yourself, keep yourself positive, and, you know, you got to do the work, you got to do the practice because what happens is, is that nerves take over, and when nerves get the better of you, we do what we practice. And if we didn't practice enough, unfortunately, we're not going to be successful on passing our driver's test. All right, so we're going to get over to the presentation here. I'll go through the presentation. So this is the way it works. Uh, go through the presentation it takes about 10 minutes 12 minutes for the presentation and then after that we come back and do the uh, questions and answers I'll answer any questions you have about passing a driver's test starting a career as a truck or bus driver being a smarter driver keeping yourself safe on the roadways and coming over and overcoming anxiety okay Ina failed your driver's test on Wednesday sorry to hear that that's really tough uh, Mad Trucker, one of my first driving lessons, there was a sudden change of weather and I drove back to my house in snow and ice. It took me 25 minutes to do a 10 minute trip. And you know, Mad Trucker, that's not unusual when you're in inclement weather. Uh, you know, usually when I'm coming from the coast, from the ferry, from BC Ferry to Wasson here in British Columbia, I can do that run in five hours, okay, in good weather. And you know, that's hammer and it's uh what is it 120 125 kilometers an hour so you're doing 70 75 mile an hour most of the way but if there's bad weather especially on the top of the coquihalla through the mountain pass there uh you're you could easily add two hours to that trip easily easily slivic uh confidence has been really big game changer awesome you can do this yes i can do this the more four most powerful words in the english language Remember that and you know if you get we all have that little voice in our head right the little voice that niggles away at us and undermines our confidence you just yell out loud I can do this and tell that little bugger to shut up shut up I can do this right you've got to just 
forge forward with that and say that. And uh, it's one of the things that's helped me to be successful in the things that I've done in my life. And there's, you know, I try to pass that on to you and it's the same thing. Get the counsel that you need and you can do it as well. Okay, Wheelman, good night. I'm perhaps you could do a video on drive axles and rear ratio pros and cons. Thank you. Uh, Wheelman, <laughs> I would I would need somebody else to help me out with that because it's that's really beyond my expertise. Uh, I'll, I'll see what I can do for you. Maybe you could make some suggestions for me about people that I could approach and whatnot. Okay, so I'm uh, going to go back here. I'll come back to the questions and answers. I'm just going to get to the presentation here and we'll get going, okay? So highway driving, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about driving on freeways. Uh, one of the other things that I want to uh, suggest to you about freeways is really start paying attention to mile markers on freeways and interstates. Specifically, uh, for those of you living in the United States, traveling on interstates in around the big cities and those types of things, pay attention to the mile markers. Do your route planning before you get on the interstate and know exactly which mile marker you're going to get off the interstate at. That will really help you out and keep you safe. And the reason that I say that uh, in terms of mile markers is because uh, you know, you're driving down the interstate, you know you're at mile marker 275 and you know that your exit is at 280. So you are beginning to prepare in the next five miles that you're gonna get off the interstate, you're gonna get off the freeway and all interstates in the world have mile markers, right? And in most states in the US, the mile markers line up with the exit numbers. You know, New York is one of the exceptions. New York likes to be a little bit different and they do some things a little bit different and that's one of the things they do different. So know that, that the exit numbers in New York are gonna be different, but they still have mile markers and so you can prepare to do that. And I'll tell you a story about that. I was teaching a driver route planning and navigation a few years ago when I was at the truck driving school. And we're going up the hill in Kamloops, British Columbia here. There's a big hill on the Trans-Canada Highway. We're at 278 and we're getting off at 265. And the, the student driver says to me, he's going up, he's behind a big, huge loaded Super B, which these things weigh out at 140,000 pounds. The thing's going slow up the hill. And he says, do I have time to pass? And I realized that the student didn't know about mile markers because we'd gone through all the route planning and we and I told the student that he had to get off at exit 265. And I realized right away that he didn't understand it. I said to him, I said, what's 278 minus 265? And he says, oh, it's seven, right? Is, that, is my math right? <laughs> 278, eight, eight and five is 13, 13 kilometers, right? So it's a 13 kilometers up the road where we're going to get off the road. And I said, you know, what's the difference between 278 and 265? So we figured that out right. And I said, you have 13 kilometers before you have to get off at your exit. And so he was able to pass the truck, get up, and then he was able to get ready for his thing. So this is one of the things that will really reduce your anxiety uh, in terms of driving on interstates and freeways is that you'll, you know, figure out the mile markers. You'll know exactly where you're going to get off the freeway or interstate, uh, you know, for your exit number here okay highways here we go okay so for those of you new to smart drive test my name is rick august uh drove truck in the 1990s from canada into the united states ltl freight mostly uh you know which means less than load means 10 or 12 drops on a truck became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997 i'm a commercial i'm a licensed driving instructor in Ontario, British Columbia, those two provinces in Canada, and I'm a licensed driving instructor in the in country of Australia, in the state of Victoria. Uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a, my doctorate in uh, legal history, which is the study of policing, courts, and prisons, and my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic, oddly enough. Uh, while I was going to university in Melbourne, Australia, I drove bus for Greyhound and one of the local bus lines there as well, so I have a... a some, <laughs> so I have both truck and bus driving experience. I've also worked with uh, driver rehabilitation, working with people who've had debilitating injuries and driving with hand controls and those types of things. And uh, for more information, you can read my autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. Look for the link down in the description there. New video this week. <laughs> yes, you're driving down the highway and all of a sudden this uh, tractor trailer rolls over like a shot pig and it's sliding towards you as you're coming down the road. So yes, uh, I basically went over that on some of the stuff you need to consider when you're driving a truck and trailer. 
and how to keep yourself safe when you're going around corners, curves, and turns. So have a look at that video. And yes, it's as terrifying as the look of my face uh, in that video, okay? Mad Trucker says he used to live in Victoria. Victoria is a great place. Used to live there myself. Uh, faster speed, okay? So obviously on interstates, freeways, and highways, you're going to be doing faster speeds, 50 uh, miles an hour or above, 80 kilometers an hour or above. For those of you doing driver's tests, uh, watching on the replay or watching now, uh, 50 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour outside of the city is the legal speed limit that you can travel unless otherwise posted. For us here in British Columbia on the Trans-Canada Highway, it's 120 kilometers an hour, which is approximately 75 miles per hour. Many of the interstates are the same. They're 70, 75 miles an hour, okay, in the U.S. there, okay? So following distance, it's imperative that you learn to keep your following distance at three to five seconds under ideal conditions, traffic conditions, okay? So you want to be looking farther down the road. That will help you center your vehicle. It will also help you to predict traffic patterns. All right, and get the big picture. What are other traffic patterns and those types of things doing? And as well, have a look at following distance. And Corey, there's another, there's a better video on following distance that I've redone. I need to take this old one down. Uh, it's in the VEDA series, uh, Corey, there. That might help you out uh, in terms of finding the following distance one there and how to measure uh how to measure following distance. There's a reason that we do following distance in time. The reason we do that is because it's relative. So when you're in the city, you are following behind and as you move out at, and uh, increase your speed, your following distance is going to increase uh, as your speed increases. And this is the why, uh, this, is, this is why, um, <laughs> this is why we use time as opposed to two or three car lengths, right? So what happens is the vehicle in front of you goes past a fixed object up along the side of the road. You start counting one crocodile, two crocodiles, three crocodiles, and at three crocodiles, you should be going past the fixed object and that way you'll have a three second following distance and you are safer and smarter. All right. Predicting road user behavior on and on ramps on freeways. So again, it's all about transitions. Where are the intersections? Where are... Uh, vehicles getting on to the roadway, the interstate and freeway, look for that because if it's a big truck, you're going to have to move over to the other lane because that big truck's going to come out. They're, that If they're loaded, you know, eight times out of ten, you're going to have to move over to the other lane to keep yourself safe because the big truck is going to be going too slow. Also, there might be a line of traffic coming out there and you need to move over. So be looking for the transitions. And again, I talked to you at the beginning about mile markers what mile marker are you going to be getting off, okay? Speeders and driving too slow, uh, you know, there's always going to be some goofball who's driving, you know, a hopped up Corvette and insisting on doing 20 or 30 miles an hour over the speed limit. Well, most of the places now in Canada and the United States, we now have excessive speeding tickets, right? Uh, so if you're doing 20 miles an hour over the speed limit and you get nailed for that, they're going to impound your vehicle. Uh, you know, the fines are crazy expensive. Uh, here in Canada, if you're doing 30 kilometers an hour over the posted speed limit, it's excessive speeding, you know, huge fine. They, they impound your vehicle. Uh, so you know, just know that if you decide that you're going to do that out on an interstate or freeway or some other place where you potentially could get caught for speeding. Okay, driving too slow is just as dangerous as driving too fast on a high speed interstate or a freeway, okay? And if you are insisting on driving the speed limit on a highway or freeway, make sure that you stay over into the right hand lane. Shoulder checking, hold your course, make sure that you do not give this up. Shoulder checking twice when you wanna uh, move over and change lanes on an interstate freeway or highway. I mean, obviously on a highway, it's gonna be on a passing lane or someplace like that, but make sure that you're still maintaining shoulder checking. Yes, you have uh, you know, blind spot detectors, you have convex mirrors and those types of things in there. And I know that there's a channel uh, here. Uh, what happened? Where did I go? Where did I go? Where did I go? Oh, I know what happened. Sorry, there we go. Okay, and I know there's a channel here uh, the, there's a video put out by the standard of automotive engineering experts or something that claims that you can adjust your mirrors for highway travel so that you can eliminate blind spots around your vehicle. It's bunk. It's total bunk. Okay. There are always blind areas around your vehicle. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. You know, if you want to adjust your mirrors that way, then that's fine. 
but know that there are always blind areas around your vehicle and you should always be shoulder checking as a backup, as double checking. Uh, don't rely on your blind spot detectors. Don't rely on your convex mirrors. You know, turn your head 90 degrees and have a look, okay? Keep yourself safe, especially on highways and freeways because most of the time it's gonna be okay, but if it goes wrong, it goes wrong badly. That's what I want you to take away from this uh, in terms of uh, driving at higher speeds. Use cruise control, okay? Especially for newer drivers, it reduces distraction. It's one less thing that you have to do. You don't have to monitor your speed while you're driving along highways and freeways. You're gonna be less fatigued when you get to your destination because you're on cruise control. And as well, set your cruise control two or three kilometers an hour, two or three miles an hour, less than the traffic flow. So for example, on the Trans-Canada Highway, it's 120 kilometers an hour, which is about 75 miles an hour. I can guarantee you that most of the cars on the Trans-Canada Highway are doing 130. That's the traffic flow. Or about 78, 79 miles an hour, almost 80 miles an hour. So if you set your cruise control at uh, you know 124, 125, you're probably not ever going to have to get out of that right-hand lane uh, because the other cars will just go around you and go past you and those types of things. And you're going to be on cruise control and you're going to be all happy duty when you get to your destination, okay? So use cruise control. It's gonna help you out. Uh, roadside assistance, breaks down in emergencies, okay? Unless it is an absolute emer emergency, your car engine blows up, do not pull over on the side of the road for any reason. It doesn't matter if you know you got the kids in the back and they had a diaper explosion, uh, somebody barfed or something like that, go down the road, get off on an off ramp, get out somewhere where it's going to be safe for you to pull over and do what you have to do and whatever those types of things, okay? Do not pull over on the side of an interstate or freeway for anything less than an absolute emergency because it is, I've been there, I've had the trucks break down on the side of the road, I've had the, the highway coaches break down. It is not a safe place to be, okay? Uh, have a cell phone, have a charger in your vehicle, and if you're broken down, put the hood up so it's kind of the universal symbol that your vehicle is broken down, all right? Uh, road trips, you know, great with kids and those types of things, but kids can get a little, you know, they get bored. So make sure that you're stopping every couple of hours uh, during your trip. Make sure that you're planning every two hours uh, to stop at a playground or a park or something like that. I know it's a little crazy right now with COVID and whatnot, but plan all of this stuff, you know, of course you're gonna have hand sanitizer, you're gonna have masks and those types of things, but kids need to get out of the car the same thing as same that you do and they need a bit of exercise and whatnot, okay? Activities and packing. Make sure you pack the vehicle so that you have access to drinks and food inside the car, you have access to maps and your phone and all of those types of things, right? Uh, activities for the kids, reading and audiobooks. Uh, one, of the, one of my favorites is audiobooks. Uh, last week when I went down to Vancouver Island, I listened to Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography, which was really, really awesome. And I would really recommend it for anybody who, who is into reading other people's biographies and autobiographies and whatnot. And for kids, they can get the book and you can get the CD or the CD of the audio and they can listen to it and look at the book and read the book while they're going. I, I'm not a big advocate of putting kids in front of screens, especially for two or three hours in the car. So that's not my thing, right? And again, as I said, every two hours, take a break. Now, the other thing, <laughs> recreational vehicles. If you're traveling in the summertime, you're traveling next weekend on Labor Day weekend and those types of things, uh, uh, RV trailers and campers, roof racks, out of state province uh, plates, these people, these things will frustrate you because they are always going slower, okay? I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't say this enough. These people will frustrate you, but you just got to hang back. You got to wait for an opening for you to get to a passing lane or someplace that you can safely pass or those types of things. So know about recreational vehicles. Know that potentially these people could be lost. They have roof racks, uh, out of state or out of province plates. Uh, the other thing that uh, will go along with that is uh, there's a... Uh, bumper sticker that says it's a rental car, you know, enterprise or budget or whichever rental car company it is, they will always have a bumper sticker. So know that they potentially could be lost as well. So expect erratic and road behavior and whatnot. Okay, passing, when to pass. If you're on a highway that's not a multi-lane highway, there's always going to be passing lanes down the roadway. And I still haven't done a video on this. I don't know why it's been so many years. I haven't done a video on how to pass because I, you know, I do it so rarely anymore because there are passing lanes and those types of things. But 
you know, this video here that I did was on a truck driver that passed on a two lane road when he could have waited three minutes to wait down the road and there was a passing lane. So I always encourage you to wait for the passing lane instead of endangering yourself and your family and other road users and whatnot. Okay, so good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Okay, and we'll get back and we'll do questions and answers here. There we go. And my friend Tim is here from Drive Smart BC. And if you want any information about traffic laws and other terrific information about court processes, about road rules and legislation and police procedures here in British Columbia, check out Tim's website, Drive Smart BC. He's got some just absolutely incredible information over there and really uh, great uh, commentary and a great community that contributes and asks questions and those types of things. So really valuable stuff there. And Tim says, I've investigated a fatal freeway side collision. Can't reinforce your advice more. Yeah, absolutely. And Tim, you might be able to answer this question for me. What is it with this new policy with police cruisers where they're sitting right out in, in, the, in the first lane of traffic? I know, I know what the, the theory is behind it. I know that they're trying to protect the vehicle that they've pulled over. But for me... It just seems dangerous. Even with the, all of the, you know, the cherries and the blueberries going, it still seems dangerous that that vehicle, I mean, it, in my mind, what would be safer for police is that if they were still protecting the vehicle in front of them, but if the cruiser was only out about two feet. But I mean, I, I think it was in Victoria, I saw the police cruiser and it was like, right, it was like on the, Pat Bay Highway, the Patricia uh, Bay Highway, and it was like right out in that first lane. And I was thinking, wow, that is really dangerous. That is like, that police cruiser is just taking up all that space. So maybe you can shed some light on that for me, Tim. Uh, my friend Lightning Farron is here. How are you, my friend? Awesome. Andre, at times I feel like I have problems staying in my lane. Uh, yes, and Andre, basically what you need to do is you need to look farther down the road. Corey's probably put up the video for you on how to stay centered in your lane. That will help you out. Uh, Wheelman, I figure rear ratio would decide the outcome uh, in tandem versus single drive. Uh, it probably does, Wheelman. Uh, and I know here in North America, they will outfit the rear ends on them. You know, you're, you're, you're really hurting my brain here. 355 rears or four. 425 I think they are rears they're going to outfit the rear ends on the truck depending on what kind of work they're doing so if, if they're pulling super bees through the mountains I think they're going to be 355 rear ends but they're going to be higher rear ends if they want better fuel economy and it's a highway truck on the flat so most trucks in the U.S. you know that aren't running the mountains are going to be a different kind of rear end but I like I said I would have to do some research for you on that and I would have to find somebody that is more on top of that than I am okay um, Tim, it's all dangerous. I kind of like, uh, the right side offset and approach. Okay. Yes. And you know, the other thing, Tim, just saying about that, there was, a, there was a horrible crash in Ontario years ago. It was had, this was years and years ago when I was driving truck and the police officer, uh, was pulled over on the side of the road. The, the, the police cruiser was right off the, off the freeway. The truck was off the freeway. Of course the lights are going and, Another truck come down, they, they, you know, they never ever did figure out what happened to the driver of the truck that crashed into them, but the truck just like drifted off the road. They, they think, you know, somebody posited and thought that the truck driver fell asleep and just drifted off the road, ran into the back of the cruiser and, you know, just ran into the back of the truck, killed both the police officer and the driver in the truck, like just like rear ended them at, you know, full highway speed. It was, it was just an awful crash. And every time I see police pulled over, I mean, we, I mean, it's much better now that we have the pullover laws and those types of things. And, and this is going a long way to keeping police officers and other crews, you know, roadside assistance crews safe. But I, every time I see that police cruiser out there, I just, oh, I, I just think, oh, it's, yeah, it's all dangerous. Absolutely. Jason, have to wait till almost Christmas for my G1 road test. Wish me luck. Uh, first time like viewer from Salt Lake Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, awesome. Hello, Jason from Sault Ste. Marie. That's brilliant. And yeah, um, it's, you know, the, the backlog of some of these driver's tests is just incredible, Jason. And, you know, I, uh, who, somebody I met the other day, oh, here in British Columbia, uh, I met him yesterday and he's 
taking his driver's test. He couldn't get a driver's test until December. So the backlog is really crazy. Uh, slow speed maneuvers. Yes, Jason, uh, Corey, I'll put up a video for you uh, there on all of the slow speed maneuvers, three point turns, uh, parallel parking, two point reverse turn, uh, backing into a stall and those types of things. <laughs> okay, Tim, Tim, thanks so much, uh, for popping in and have a great night. Enjoy dinner. Okay. Uh, Nathan cheers. Okay. Excellent. Wrong video. Corey put up the wrong video. All good. Uh, Nathan, how do you assess if you are dead center of the lane? The driver's seat is slightly offset to the left. Yes. Uh, one of the things you can do, Nathan, that's a quick check. I mean, first of all, you want to be looking farther down the road and following the traffic as you're driving. But the other quick check that you can do to make sure that you're centered in the roadway is, is that when you look down at the fog line, excuse me, on the far right side there, the fog line should be in the center of your vehicle. And again, that video on how to stay centered in the vehicle, in the, in the lane will help you out with that. Okay. Grace, uh, can you throw more light on bay parking? Okay. So Grace, one of the things you want to do in terms of bay parking, when you're backing into the space, first of all, do the other maneuvers. Okay. Uh, you know, slow speed maneuvers, do your driving along pylons, backing up along pylons, your reverse parking and those types of things. And try and do your bay parking uh, with cones first, if you can, before you actually go out and do the real thing in a parking lot. The other piece of uh, information that I give to smart drivers is, is that when you're bay parking, always try and park behind beside another car. Because if there isn't another car, it's really tough to kind of get into those lines because you can't see the lines, right? Whereas if there's another car there, you just pull in beside that other car and you wanna be about a meter, three feet away from that other vehicle. And it's a really easy landmark, especially if you're pulling in on the driver's side, because if you can keep the vehicle on the driver's side, that's your sight side, right? So it's a lot easier to bay park along beside another vehicle. And if you can't, obviously, you know, you're know you gonna to have to back into a space uh, and do the best you can. Now, the other piece that I give to smart drivers is in the off hours, wherever you're going to be taking your test at whatever test center, go in in the off hours in the evening or go in on the weekend and practice parking because there's usually designated parking uh, at these test centers for, uh, for those taking driver's tests, okay, on-road driver's tests. So go in and practice the parking there. The other, the last uh, piece for bay parking is, is that don't try and get too close to the concrete barrier at the back. Usually there's gonna be one there because you know, lots of new drivers bang into them. So they put a concrete barrier there. Uh, it's better to be out a little bit farther and get maybe a couple of demerit points as opposed to backing up too far and striking that concrete barrier. Because if you strike that concrete barrier, that's an automatic fail in your driver's test. So don't be, don't bang into that, okay? Uh, Margaret, I had a question about speed limit. Is driving the speed limit too slow? It says it's illegal to drive over the speed limit and I don't want to get a ticket as uh, I'm a new driver. Uh, Margaret, if you're preparing for your driver's test, drive the, the posted speed limit. If you have your driver's license already, just remind me, I can't remember Margaret. There's <laughs> a lot of people here going up. But if, if you have your license, then keep up with the traffic flow because if you keep up with the traffic flow, that's going to keep you uh, staying predictable on the roadway and it's going to keep you safer. So, so stay with the traffic flow if you have your driver's license. But if you're preparing for your driver's test, then drive the posted speed limit. All right. Uh, uh, okay. So Wheelman, basically, which generates more torque, tandem or single drive axles? Uh, no videos on this topic or answers. Uh Actually, Wheelman, I don't think that the gear, like obviously the rear ends, and I don't think it's a single or a tandem is going to determine whether you have more torque. Uh, the torque comes from the transmission, the rear, the gearing, and the engine. All of that, you know, is going to work together to create torque on your rear axles. But I don't think whether you have a tandem or whether you have a single is going to change how much torque is going to the ground at the back. Obviously, with a tandem, you're going to have more traction because you've got more tires, right? So one could argue that you have more traction with a, with a tandem. But again, all of this is beyond my expertise. I, I would need to help get somebody else to help you out with all that. Okay, so Margaret, so you're not licensed yet. Excellent, thank you for reminding me. So what you need to do is you need to drive the posted speed limit, okay? And get your vehicle up to speed as quickly as possible. The other piece, uh, Margaret, to keep in mind is, is that remember space management 
trumps speed okay so if you're trying to maintain your three second following distance but the traffic in front of you is not driving the posted speed limit then you're going to drive a bit slower to maintain that safe following distance from the traffic in front of you okay jerry how are you my friend thanks again for all your help uh your videos gave me helping me get my license keep up the awesome work and thank you jerry for your support here your enthusiasm all that stuff and congratulations on getting your license we're so happy we could help and, and get you going there with your license and i believe you're in philadelphia i, I if i remember correctly uh <laughs> pathfinder rick is the obi-wan of driving i need to i need a you know a brown jedi <laughs> cloak for that thank you so much uh grace uh 6 p.m pacific standard time so it's 9 p.m eastern standard time is the time that i always start the live streams every sunday now next week because it's a holiday the labor day weekend i will probably move it to the monday and probably do it on the monday so any week any weekend that's a long weekend I generally do it on the Monday as opposed to the Sunday, just because, you know, we all want to hang out and have fun and go away for the long weekend. Okay, Katie, hi, Rick. I signed up for my driving test in Ohio towards the end of September. That's awesome. And speaking of that, Katie, I just reshot the Ohio maneuverability test because one of the things that I didn't do in this, the previous two videos that I did on the Ohio maneuverability test uh, was I didn't stop at the nose cone so the back of the car is the bumper of the car is in line with the nose cone and then when you back out you have to stop so the front of the car is in line with the two back cones so i uh, didn't know that so i reshot the video today with that in mind and as well my older videos i watched them and i watched the introduction i went man that guy is just like droning on for like two minutes that man has sucked two minutes out of my life <laughs> So I'm, I'm reshooting my videos and I'm getting right to it. Right after the intro, I'm getting into it. <laughs> Not droning on for like two minutes about stuff that, you know, really could be cut out. All right. Uh, Pathfinder, basic troubleshooting videos for new drivers, please, knowing your car. Okay. Uh, we, we have a couple of those, Pathfinder, but you're right. I could do a few more of those for you. Matthew, my friend from Cornell, just wanted to say I got my class one license on the 12th. I watched your videos over and over, helped with my road test. Awesome. That is really great, Matthew. Congratulations on getting your class one. Uh, that's the CDL license to drive tractor trailer here in the province of British, uh, British Columbia. Quinell is up north, way up, up north, not like up my nose, but like up north in British Columbia. <laughs> and uh, Matthew, you, do you have a, a job lined up yet at this point? That's that's really great. Uh, Margaret, can you do a video on driving in a city if you haven't already? Uh, Margaret, I would really strongly suggest you have a look at the space management video. Corey will put that up for you. That would really help you out, Margaret, in terms of managing space, managing speed, and driving in the city. That'll help you out with that. Uh, Katie, yes, <laughs> my older videos. Grace, uh, my test is coming up towards the 23rd of September. That's really great that you guys are getting tests in September's and those types of things because I know that some people have, it's just been a backlog. Uh, Pathfinder, you're most welcome. Safia, uh, hi Rick, I have my test on Wednesday. I would love to know how to judge the gap of oncoming traffic when you have to turn left at an intersection. Timothy, what's up? What's up, my friend? Awesome. So, Safia, uh, Corey will put the video up on turning left and as well judging the gap. Uh, so, he'll put those two videos up for you. Basically, what you need, Safia, is you need about four to eight seconds, depending on the left turn, how far you're turning and those types of things. But again, as I say for left-hand turns, is, is that you stop and wait for the gap with your front steer tires on the front crosswalk line. The reason you do that is, is that you're committed to the intersection, but you're not in the intersection in the event that something goes wrong. So what happens is you're sitting there, you're waiting, you're watching the cars approaching, you're seeing the gap approaching, and what happens then is, is that you move forward to meet the gap. So the gap's here, you're here, the gap's coming, you see the gap, and then you start moving forward and you meet the gap. And what happens when you meet the gap? Now you have forward momentum you've got some speed in the car and then you just simply turn expediently and you cut down the amount of time that you are in that danger zone where you're cross face to the oncoming traffic we call it cross face it's a, it's a jujitsu term cross face 
It's basically when you grab a hold of the guy's collar and stick your arm into their throat so that they won't push up against you. It's the danger zone. <laughs> It's, it's like doing a left-hand turn. You want to minimize that time that you're in the danger zone. So you're going to need anywhere between four to six to eight seconds, depending on that. The other thing in the judging gap video that I suggest uh, is, is that you just go out and sit at a corner, a busy intersection, somewhere where you're going to be doing your driver's test and then start counting how long, uh, you know, judging gaps, right? Just count the distance between different vehicles. So the front vehicle passes a fixed object and you start counting. One, one dinosaur, two dinosaurs, three dinosaurs, four dinosaurs, five dinosaurs, six dinosaurs. And then you start to get an understanding of how big that gap is and how much time you need. And the other thing, again, when you're turning left, you know, start counting. When you start, when you actually physically start moving into the intersection, uh, you know, one dinosaur, two dinosaurs, three dinosaurs, four dinosaurs, five dinosaurs, and then you know it's sort of six to 12 seconds that you're in that intersection, that that's how long it takes you to turn. And that will really help you out and keep you safe. And then the last thing you can do, and this is for all the smart drivers watching now, or those of you on the replay, if you're not sure how to judge gap, or you're having trouble with it, or you think that you're just, you know, cutting it too close, just somebody you trust a veteran driver who's got some years experience just get them to go with you and then they can you can just practice some left turns for half an hour or 40 minutes and they can say okay that's a good gap go and then you're going to judge it and they're going to say no no that's too close okay and that will help you out as well because the thing about teaching gap and i realized this when i did the video that it was really tough for me to teach it on camera because it's a very it's an experiential thing that as driving instructors and mentors, we work with the student in the, you know, in the situation, right? It, at the moment. <laughs> so actually teaching it on camera is a little bit tougher uh, than actually working with the student one-on-one -on -one in the vehicle. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Corey, for getting those up. Matthew, yeah, I got a job lined up with a company pulling Super Bs from Vanderhoof to Vancouver. Just uh, talking with my drivers to see who's going to train me for my position. And that's awesome. And what and uh, Matthew, just out of curiosity, what kind of uh, are you are you pulling wood chips? Because generally, super bees here in British Columbia is wood chips. Uh, and how long are how long's the training that they're going to help you with? Because wow, Matthew, at least at least Matthew, you've got a couple of months before the snow flies up on top of the Coquihalla. Because I'm pretty sure, yeah, you're coming from Vanderhoof, so you're going to be going down. Yeah, you're going to be running through the canyon. Uh, coming down with a set of super bees so you're going to have a unfortunately you're going to have a couple of months to get used to this before <laughs> you got to start throwing chains on the truck and those types of things so yeah that's really good so yeah uh how long are you how long's the training that they're going to give you uh for your running your super bees down through the mountains there uh wheelman how are my kids my kids are awesome uh working on math and actually talking about cars <laughs> as soon as i get down the live stream tonight and I'll post a couple of pictures. Uh, we're going to go to the drive-in theater tonight. So that's what we're doing as soon as I get done the live stream. Someone asked about kids. No. <laughs> go away. I'm not done yet. Okay? i got to finish. There you go. There's my kids. Uh, Pathfinder, in your video on how not to die, you told us about when you are driving the trailer. How about if you are the one on the other lane? And about to crash onto the trailer, what initially could you do? Uh, you know, Pathfinder, that's an excellent question. I was gonna do a, I was gonna do a reshoot of that video because you know something I thought, I, I negotiated with Viral Hog for that video. I paid for that video, <laughs> and I did all the stuff. And the and the video, it, it bombed. That video bombed. So I need to redo the video. I need to you know do a little short version of it. But that's an excellent question. The, you know something, the drivers of the other cars did exactly what they should have done. They just kept moving over to the right. And anytime that you get into uh, a video, or a video, anytime you get into an emergency situation, when you look up and you go, oh crap, oh crap. <laughs> you know, there's a truck on its side sliding towards you. And you know, you just, you gotta move over to the right as far as you can get. And you know, that's, if you see the cars in the picture after the crash, tremendous amounts of property damage, tremendous amounts of property damage. I mean, that truck was loaded. I think it was loaded with chicken fries, uh, the tractor trailer unit. And 
you know, the load was spread all over the highway because, I mean, those trailers just, as soon as they flop over, they just drop on the ground. Or as soon as they flop over, they open up. They just open up like a sardine can. And there's just like chicken fries all over the place. So the truck was loaded. I mean, it was 100,000 pounds. And, you know, it's coming down and it's sideways sliding down. And those other cars, they did exactly what they did. And it was, you know, it was a miracle, you know, touch wood that nobody nobody was seriously injured nobody was hurt in that crash it was just enormous amounts of property damage so yeah and anytime that that happens that you're like looking down the road and something's going then you know move to the right move to the right get over as quick as you can and uh, I'll, t I'll tell you a story uh, you know same thing uh, I was driving truck in 2016 I went back for two weeks driving truck and I'm driving to Edmonton and it's up number 16 highway here in Northern British Columbia that you go north from Kamloops all the way up and you, you turn at Mount Robson, you go across to Edmonton and I come down, we're, you know, single two lane, blah, blah, blah. And I get this truck in front of me, uh, 70 kilometers an hour, 75 miles an hour, 80 kilometers an hour, 90 kilometers, up and down, up and down. And there's nothing that drives me more crazy than, a, than following somebody or trying to follow somebody who's not doing a constant speed. I don't care if you're doing the speed limit, but do a constant speed. And so this truck was up and down, up and down. Okay, so finally I'm like, okay, we're going downhill. And I'm like, okay, I'm going for it. And I get out beside this other truck. So two tractor trailers going down the freeway, side by side, and we're nose to nose. We're, we're like this, coming down the hill. And I look down the hill, and around the, around the curve from the bottom, a car comes up. And I'm thinking, and just as I see the car, I'm thinking to myself, okay, do I climb on the brakes? <laughs> and haul back in behind this guy or do I just stay on the throttle and keep going because you got to realize and this this goes for Matthew here that when you're out and you're trying to pass an tractor trailer and you're trying to pass another tractor trailer two minutes two three minutes out in the other in the, in the other lane it seems like an eternity anyway this car come up and as soon as he looked up the hill the not he the driver looked up the hill because it might have been a woman too that driver just pulled over onto the shoulder of the road. <laughs> and as soon as I saw the driver of the car pull over to the side, I was like, yeah, we're going. And I just kept on, I just kept on the hammer and went past this other guy. But, you know, sometimes in driving, those are the split second decisions that you need to make. And, and it, it happened, right? I did everything right. Didn't see the driver, but misjudged the gap. And you need to figure out when you're passing what are you going to do is it are you you know are you going to haul on the brakes and then climb back in the car that you tried to get by or are you going to keep going so you gotta that's how it goes uh melissa where'd you go i saw you there oh and then you just you retracted it okay confused uh left turns and judging gap is the scariest thing for me currently as a new driver i only have a permit and yes uh gecko it's tough. It's one of those things that's, you know, you have to learn as a new driver, but it's, it's not easy. It's, it's definitely challenging for sure. Okay. Uh, Katie, uh, by any chance, is there a way to find out the points they deduct if you do something wrong? I'm not sure how to word that correctly. No, I know what you're talking about, uh, Katie. You know, there's, there's plenty of stuff here on the thing that you got to figure out, but what, what I would caution you Katie is is that you know don't get caught up in losing demerits and those types of things right for the driver's test you just want to pass you can work on perfection later if you get a few demerit points you know that's totally fine totally fine if you if you lose a few demerits but it's better to lose a few demerits than to have an automatic fail so do your practicing and those types of things right okay so what you can do for example say uh, you back up and you're too far out on the space, right? When you're, when you're bay parking, five points. Or you're too far from the curb when you parallel park. That's going to be another 10 points, okay? So things like that. Uh, if you're driving down the, in the lane uh, when you're in the city and you move, drift to the left or drift to the right, that's going to be five points. If you actually touch the line on your lane, that's going to be 10 points. So those are kind of how the stuff goes you know, improper signaling, those types of things. It's usually going to be kind of two to five to eight points that you're going to lose. But you really want to concentrate on what you're doing and keeping yourself safe and just passing the test. It doesn't matter how many demerits you get assigned. Go for pass. You can go for perfection and being a smarter driver after you get your license because there's a lot to learn after you get your license. Okay. 
Uh, Melissa, I have a quick question. If my windshield has a small chip, it's not noticeable. Can I still drive it on the test? It's on the passenger side near the middle. Uh, you can, uh, Melissa. What I would suggest to you as well, <laughs> and talking about that, I just noticed that my windshield today had a chip in it. Take it into the windshield repair place right away. Get them to fix it. It's only going to be about $50 or $60, uh, depending on where you are, which place you take it to. Because if you get it fixed now, well, it's just a little chip, they can fix it in inexpensively. If you wait and it cracks the windshield, then you got to replace the whole windshield, and the whole windshield is going to cost you $400 to $600, depending on what kind of vehicle you have. I mean, you may have insurance that will cover that sort of thing, but that's not what you want. Just take it in and spend the 50 bucks and get them to fix the chip, and then there's no worries, right? Like I said, I got one on mine, and a couple of years ago, I had stone chips, and it turned into a crack, and then I had to get the windshield replaced, and it was almost $500 to get the windshield replaced, okay? Uh, Pathfinder split second decisions uh, video as well. That would be great for the next topic. Yeah, <laughs> excellent, awesome. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm still laughing about that video about the truck that just flopped over. And I, you know, but I, essentially what I did was I did an analysis of what the truck did and what the driver could have done differently. And you know, this also goes not just for tractor trailer drivers. This goes for any drivers pulling a trailer, whether you're pulling a boat. Uh, you know, your recreational trailer, you're pulling a, a utility trailer, curves, corners, and turns. Get slowed down before you get into the curve, corner, or turn. Get your throttle, your foot into the throttle, into the gas, the accelerator, and make sure you're pulling that trailer through the curve, corner, or turn. Because if you don't, if you don't have the towing unit in front of that trailer, that trailer is just going to decide to go where it wants to go. And on a curve, so if the curve's this way, the trailer wants to go that way because that's the force. So you want it to go that way, not that way. And if you let it determine what it's going to do, it's going to go off in the direction it wants to go. Okay. Uh, confused, why did I choose to become a driving instructor? Uh, confused, the read gecko. The reason I became a driving instructor was in 1997, I was still driving truck over the road and I wanted to come off the road. I needed to figure out something to do to get off the road and becoming a driving instructor was how I got started. Actually, I didn't start start as a car driving instructor, weirdly enough, uh, in the province of Ontario, Canada, you're certified as a truck driving instructor. So I became an air brake instructor, truck driving instructor, couldn't get a job because I didn't have my driving instructor's license because to teach kids how to drive cars or to, sorry, not kids to drive, to teach, <laughs> can't talk. To teach teenagers how to drive cars, you have to be licensed and you have to take the cor the requisite courses to get licensed as a driving instructor. So after a couple of years of not being able to get a truck driving instructor job, I went back to driving school and got my, my driving instructor's license and then I was qualified to teach truck driving. So it's kind of a weird system that they have in Ontario. But here in uh, British Columbia uh, under ICBC, it's quite rigorous to get your driving instructor's license. And actually I had to requalify and redo all of the tests here uh, to get my license back. Same thing when I went to Australia. I think in Australia, I took a six week course to become a driving instructor in Australia. And you know, and then after that, you know, I drove buses while I was in Australia. I went to university, finished my undergraduate degree at the University of Western Ontario, which is now called Western Ontario, which is weird that they changed the name of my university. Uh, and then I got accepted to the University of Melbourne and did my graduate degree there. Pathfinder, your kids rock. Don't don't tell them that you said that because <laughs> they'll be back. <laughs> they'll be back. Uh, Katie, luckily he entered the other lane and just uh, sped past me, but it was scary since he was right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bot, my friend, he recently passed his driver's test. Congratulations, Bot. How can I stay active with driving after my test? Uh, dr drive your car. Not everywhere, obviously, because I don't drive my car everywhere. But, uh, you know, take your friends, go to the movies. We're going to the drive-in tonight. That's very excited. I'm very excited about that. I'm not really excited about the movies, but it's going to be fun. SpongeBob. <laughs> uh, Pathfinder, you're most welcome. Katie, I was driving home from my friend's house, and I had my friend with me since he has his license. I was entering a roundabout when some guy decided to speed up and take the turn hard. It scared me. Yes, and you know that's unfortunate, Katie, that that's what happened in the roundabout. But you know, just take your foot off the throttle, let them carry on with those kinds of things and whatnot. 
Uh, wheelman, rollovers can happen on curves with a high center of gravity load. Yes, and that is one of the things, wheelman, that they love to talk about in the driving manuals. What, now, I'm trying to think of what the other one is. Hanging meat. Do we actually hang meat in refrigeration trailers anymore? I actually don't think we do. Uh, the other one was um, tanker trailers. They used to not have baffles in them. <laughs> I mean, who, who thought of that? You have... I don't know, 20,000 gallons of liquid in a tanker trailer that's not baffled. When, what I mean by baffles is, so you got the big tanker truck with the wheels under it, right? And there's uh, like little walls with holes in them here because what used to happen, and one of the guys I, I talked to who taught one of my truck driving courses, I uh, used to drive tanker and there was no baffles in the tanker. And he said you would drive forward, you get into third gear and then you'd wait and the truck would like slosh forward as all the liquid in the tank came forward and then it would go back. And then you start shifting gears again. And I'm just thinking to myself, that is not safe in any stretch of any wildest imagination, having all of this liquid sloshing around in this huge tank going down the road. So, yes, high center loads. There's, you know, and there's there are those. Uh, you know, the other thing that they used to do, uh, put in the back of tractor trailers, was eight-foot rolls of paper. Yeah, talk about high center loads. Yeah, so when you got a high center load, not only do you want to have your speed down, but you also want to make sure that you're pulling that trailer because, again, it's just going to flop over like a dead pig. And the other, I mean, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about velocitization, talking about interstates and freeways. And all you got to do is go on YouTube and you'll see all kinds of fails where the, the truck driver is driving the truck, comes up to the off ramp, doesn't realize that he or she is going way too fast and goes around the corner and the thing just like flops over like a shot pig and you know that's what i tell drivers especially new drivers if you realize when you come off that interstate and you see that off ramp and you're not sure get that truck down to the speed uh that it says on the cautionary signs because you don't know and the other thing is is that it's much better to lock that thing up in a straight line and flat spot those tires than it is to take the chance of, oh, I'm going to get around that curve because you probably aren't going to get around that curve. Okay? <laughs> so, yeah, know that. My friend Epic, how are you? Lightning, hello. Great kids, yes. Uh, it is much riskier on older freeways because you have shorter deceleration acceleration lanes. Uh, some interstate highways have those types of ramps and off ramps. Yes, they do. And they some of those Epic they have not got to yet. You're absolutely correct. Uh, Salty, passed my road test this Friday in downtown Calgary. Thanks for the tips. Uh, Salty, you're most welcome. Uh, Marvin, do you uh, practice of driving videos? Marvin's, yes, I have lots of practice driving videos here on the channel. What is it specifically uh, that you're looking for? Because we can probably find a video for you. Uh, Margaret, will I need a CDL if I want to eventually drive a converted school bus recreational vehicle? Uh, Margaret, you won't need a CDL license, uh, but does your converted school bus have air brakes on it? It probably has juice brakes if it's a converted school bus. Uh, juice brakes, hydraulic brakes. Only if you have air brakes will you have to get an air brake ticket to drive that vehicle. Okay, uh, excellent. So yeah, so have a look at that video, it's kind of fun. Not kind of fun for the people that were, you know, the truck was careening towards as it flopped over on the highway. But uh, this week we're getting up the remake of the Ohio Maneuverability Test. I'm hoping that I can get two up this week, but it's going to be a busy week because I'm focusing on the website and getting the website cleaned up and those types of things because I realize that there's a lot of work that needs to be done <laughs> over there. But we're doing questions and comments and those types of things. So uh, if you have any questions, you have any comments, uh, leave a comment down in the comment section there and I'll get to it. We'll answer that and uh, help you out to get your driver's test. Uh, the other thing that came up this week on the community tab, and just be aware of this, there are not only documents that you have to sign to get your license when you go in for your driver's test, but also if you are under age, you have to sign the COVID document saying that you don't have a flu, you don't have fever, you're not exhibiting any of the signs of COVID and those types of things. And unfortunately, we had a smart driver who was denied his or her test because they took their grandmother with them and they didn't have their parent or guardian to be able to sign the COVID documents and therefore they were denied their driver's test. So know that if you haven't already taken the, the uh, your parent or guardian in to sign, 
then uh, that could be a requirement and you might want to just check that out before you show up for your driver's test you don't want to be denied because you don't have your parent or guardian with you okay uh, Lazaro I missed my answer I asked earlier which over-the-road company you recommend me to get trained I'm a CDL class A driver uh, Lazaro are you in the States if you're in the States uh, there's two or three really good companies that provide excellent training uh, that I would uh, counsel you to go and apply for as a job. And this is the other thing uh, for no new for new CDL drivers, Class One, Class A drivers. Uh, go with a company that's going to provide some training, especially if you just came out of truck driving school. You need some training because I'll tell you right now, the new the you know <laughs> the real learning starts after you get your license, not when you get your license. That was just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and this, you know, Matthew who's in Quinnell and he's going to be running super bees from Quinnell down to Vancouver. You know, that's, that's a tough run, especially with winter coming up and snow and running through the mountains and those types of things. You know, you got to deal with paperwork. You got to deal with log books. You got to deal with, uh, you know, the scale house, yeah, making sure you have the, all your paperwork in order, getting to the other end, loading, unloading, getting into truck stops safely, getting into, you know, your shippers safely, where you're going to load and where you're going to unload and those types of things. There is a lot of stuff going on. And if you can have somebody else who can mentor you and show you what you need to do and how to do it all safely. And, you know, on top of that, you got to drive the truck, right? Because, you know, one of my favorite questions <laughs> for, you know, truck and bus drivers was, you know, why do truck and truck, uh, you know, why do they get paid? What do they do? What? Why do they get paid? And, you know, very few students at truck driving school could answer that question about why truck drivers get paid. You know, and the reality is, is that bus and truck drivers get paid to deliver freight and services between point A and point B as quickly as possible. That's what you get paid for, you know, because they get paid to drive. No, they don't get paid to drive. You get paid to transport freight and services. That's what you get paid to do. Driving the truck is inconsequential. I drive my car all the time, but I don't get paid for it. So, and in, able, in, in order to do that, and to do that safely, there's a lot of other things that go with that, okay? So, uh, Katie, uh, it is okay since my mom doesn't drive and my dad can't come, that my friends uh, comes with me, she has a valid license. It, it probably is Katie, but the other thing that you need to do uh, is make sure that there aren't any documents that you need or parent or guardian to sign. So just check that out first. You know, it might even be you just going down to the test center and, and asking the frontline people if there are any documents that need to be signed by a parent or guardian. And then you could potentially get those documents beforehand. And then you could get your mom or dad to sign them. And then when you show up for your driver's test, you could just bring those documents with you, with you already signed and you're not going to be... Uh, denied a driver's test, okay? Daddy, can we join the video? You're all done. I want to join the live stream. <laughs> all right. Hey, okay. <laughs> all right, you're. Hey, everybody. No, over there. Over there. What's up? Move it. Um. Wheelman said, uh, new truck drivers, it really helps if someone shows them the ropes. Absolutely, Wheelman. Mm, I totally agree. Butt. Okay. Say hi to everybody. Hi. Where are we going? Movie, movie theater. theater. Okay, the movie theater. Okay, please do not. This is Taco Bear and Burn. <laughs> okay. This is my new toy that I got. Okay. Yeah, I want you to make my new toy. <laughs> All right. Bear. Okay, not Burn. cool. Not cool. What? Okay. Thirsty. Say hi to everybody. Hi. hi. Okay, say bye to everybody. Ugh, I'm what's up? One. What's up? Bye, bye. Fritter. Bye. 18. Okay, there Thank we go. Thank you, Lightning. Baron. Okay, there we go. Yes, we're very All right. kids. It is a cute bear. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you. Okay, go. Let me finish. No! All right, Bye. if you're watching on the replay, you're watching now, leave us a comment, leave us a question. You have yes, any... please like a comment. Stop. And subscribe and hit the bell button. And we'll help you out to get your driver's license, get you going on a CDL license, a career as a truck or bus driver, and remember... Pick the best answer, not, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. All the best. Bye now.